Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to SiteEvNet's 20th anniversary. My name is Ben Dayton, and I'm SiteEvNet's managing editor. A lot has changed since SiteEvNet was launched back in 2001. Back then, we were talking about Bush instead of Trump, pseudoscience instead of fake news, and ozone instead of methane. Yet many of the issues remain the same and are even more pressing. Climate change, healthcare inequities seen today in the vast inequalities in the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines and hunger. That's why our work at SIDEV to make the case for science and global development is ever more important. And we can see that by our burgeoning reach numbers, our content was seen or heard almost half a billion times last year and looks set to surpass that this year. But none of this is gonna be possible without our, would have been possible without our supporters and funders. CEDA, Welcome, IDRC, the Bosch Foundation, IRD, to name just a few. And of course, our parent organization, CABI. To mark our anniversary, we've produced a special edition magazine and a report on science journalism. And those will shortly be circulated to you and can be seen on our websites. We thought it would be fitting to celebrate the anniversary with a discussion on the changing face of science journalism following the pandemic and in general. After that, we'll move to spatial chat for a networking event. I'll now hand you over to our moderator, Marta Entradas. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Trades. I'm an assistant professor at the Lisbon University Institute, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, it is obviously a big pleasure as one of the authors to see this report out uh, and to see its launch today on the 20th uh, anniversary of the Science Dev. <clears throat> we'll now start the debate, which will take uh, around an hour, uh, on the state of science journalism in the world. We have three speakers who are authors of this study and who will be talking about the report. And we have four other panelists who are science dev regional coordinators who will ref reflect on the findings uh, of the report in their regions. I will now <clears throat> invite Tim Bloghid, who is executive director at the World Federation of Science Journalists, and he will talk about the wider context of science journalism and the report um, for five minutes. Please, Tim. Thank you, Marta. Um, the, uh, it's an honor to be here on the 20th anniversary of uh, SciDev.net. I actually remember where I was 20 years ago at a meeting in Ottawa at IDRC headquarters uh, when uh, uh, this uh, organization was being formed and to, it makes me feel old to, uh, to think of all that time past, but it also is astonishing to see the accomplishments and the, uh, uh, the network and the culture that has grown up around this institution. It's, uh, as I say, it's an honor to be part of this. And in that context, uh, this uh, survey is emblematic of that same spirit in the sense that uh, as executive director, I get a, uh, all these tiny windows into the lives of science writers all over the world. Uh, they, they send me notices about something they've written or something they're doing, or they have a question, or they just have an idea that they want to share. And it's wonderful, you, you, know, you, do, you get these glimpses into people's lives, but what you want is the bigger picture, the shared context. Um, and what's remarkable is that the World Federation is made up of 67 different organizations in 51 countries. And the amount of diversity is daunting, but as this report shows, there is a remarkable homogeneity to the culture that they share. And this continues to impress me. Um, I had suspected this from the little snippets that I get, as I say, on a daily basis, but when you see this broader picture uh, and when you also realize how much people have shared in this report, I, I was amazed at how generous people were. We really got granular here and saw into people's lives 
the things that still inspire them, the things that are frustrating them, their pessimism or optimism about the future. Um, and it's this kind of data that we need because we can, we can talk about where to move, what kinds of policies to set, where to invest money, where to educate people. But unless we have this information, we will find it very hard to actually change people's lives. So this, this has moved from glimpses into people's lives to a larger picture that we can begin discussing. And it's a two-way street. These same people will now have access to the information in the report and it will, uh, uh, it will build up that relationship with each of them that much more strongly. Uh, I, I can't say enough about this. I will say one thing, there, there may be academics out there that, that criticize the, uh, you know, the, the style or the approach and say, oh, this is too simplistic. This is, this is just you know, uh, 600 people out of however many people in the world that are doing this. And to them, I would say what Churchill said about democracy is that this is maybe the worst science journalism report, except for all the others. And consequently, we have a definitive document that we can produce here. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for these very nice words. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, Martin Bauer, professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and also an author of this report. Please, Martin. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marta, and thank you very much, Tim, to set the context for this in very nice uh, invitation. C can I share a document? Uh, does this work, hopefully? Something is coming up here? Yes, perfect. Good. Yeah, I'd like to take up uh, Tim's challenge that this might be the worst uh, report uh, on science journalism, except from everything else. This is indeed a, a very interesting challenge. Uh, uh, colleagues, I, I'm not a science writer nor, nor a science journalist. I'm basically a, a social scientist with a, a denomination in, in psychology, social psychology. I work basically on public opinion. Uh, and uh, in the wider context, I'm interested in the place of science in society. And clearly, Science writing is an imp important uh, uh, channel uh, of uh, conversation uh, of science in society. And in that sense, this is very much uh, fitting uh, my, my own personal uh, academic interests. But I'm, I'm very pleased that I can serve this community. And let me make a, a few comments of, of how this came about. So a few observations on the side of science journalism monitor. Uh, I think we have, we have to take the, the key the key, the cue a little bit from something that probably lingers over the last 15 years, a sense of crisis in journalism in general. And there is uh, often the, the, the key, the cue comes from, from the United States. Uh, whether this is the future everywhere, we could leave open for the moment, but uh, it is often uh, seen as such. And this continues to be as an observational issue. Uh, is there a crisis in general journalism uh, at the moment? Uh, there's clearly evidence uh, for that in the United States. You get these figures. There's the, the crisis of the, the, the traditional legacy newspaper, uh, a legacy uh, media. You can see here a collapse of 50% of jobs in newspapers and no compensation of that at all in the digital world. And we are living through the digital revolution. And no, no, normally a technological revolution is just replacing employment from one sector to the other, but that doesn't seem to happen in, in the news world. So a, a, a news feature, a, a news employment is, is, is collapsing, while a new form of news employment is not really emerging. That seems to be the a kind of a feature. Uh, this is another graphic which shows the number of editorial staff in legacy uh, newspapers. You can see here from about 2008 onwards, it has really collapsed. But it also shows you what might be called the golden age of newspapers. And I've heard the term the golden age of science journalism, somewhere between 1985 and maybe 2010. And I think that might be uh, an issue uh, for, for us to think about this golden age that we might have uh, lost or something like that. Now, one implication uh, for journalism in general and for science journalism in particular might be 
this uh, <coughs> this uh, reversal uh, about I used to call science communication is flourishing, but not necessarily independent science reporting. So in the UK, this, for example, manifests itself in this uh, huge exp expansion of public relations activities, which means basically to report science in the in the in the service of an institution, a university or a research unit, versus independent positions of writing about this and evaluating this. So uh, a few years ago, uh, the British uh, Association for Science Writers met, and I think they came to the conclusion that six public relations officials, officials, officers are now feeding one journalist, and probably this figure, this is figure 2012, I suspect 10 years later, this is even worse. I probably couldn't, I can't put the, the number on this. So crisis, what crisis in principle stimulated us uh, about 10 years ago, a little bit more to think about how, what's the position of science journalists beyond the individual glimpses of, uh, of, per, uh, of personal stories and, and give the larger pictures to win, uh, to which uh, Tim has alluded. Uh, I, took the, I took the call from Nature, uh, Broomfield uh, at Nature, whom I don't personally know, but he published a, a few pages, a, a note on a survey uh, they did on, on about 500 journalists ahead in the Nature Network. And I was a bit struck because he basically called this, is this the end of science journalism? And he basically uh, made his conclusion on the basis of nearly 100% US and European observations. And I was immediately struck. And this is much obvious now under, under COVID, you cannot make a survey in Europe and then say, the whole world is in crisis. It depends where is there a crisis. So in 2009-12, we kind of set out to think about, is this a global crisis or is this a kind of a local crisis? And so we could try to uh, collect uh, various attempts, uh, not least the meeting of the World Association of Science Journalism in London, 2009 it was, and then Luisa in, in, in Latin America. So we tried to develop this survey and then finally got SIDEF involved in 2012 and we made this a bit more global at the time. And you can see here, it's the, the nature survey in red and the blue is what we then had as, as additional data uh, to, uh, to compare more globally. Is there a kind of a moment of crisis? Where's the situation in general about science, science journalism? In principle, when you, do, when you have such an aspiration of creating a bigger picture, you have two problems. What is the population? <laughs> I don't want to go into long discussions, but uh, Luisa, myself and others had long conversations of what is the population? In other words, beyond the word, the, the nominal expression, science journalism, science communicators, where is this population? How do we find it? It's easy to say the population of the, of the United Kingdom, because there's something like a list of passport holders in principle, which you have, but there's no list of science journalists journalists. So who are these science journalists, how to reach them, and where are they listed? That's a kind of a first problem. And then the second problem we have is what to ask to characterize their practice. Let me say a few things. So clearly we have a few intuitions about the world of science reporting and science communication. There are scientists who are doing it, and increasingly so again, this is my kind of historical picture here, from 1900 onwards, the scientists doing it most and then disappearing and coming back, so blogging and so on. And then you have the emergence of the professional science writers in, in the post-war period, and they are certainly still around and that's what we're looking for. But then you also have the public relations communications officers who work for a particular institution and take a good living out of this. And you have increasingly also activists working for Greenpeace or other institutions, uh, NGOs with an interest in that. Yes. So for this particular study in 2021, we basically mobilized a number of networks, which we thought had lists of members. And we use a kind of a snowball sample to get a sense, uh, uh, to get access to this, uh, to this population called science journalists. So we don't know how many science journalists there are in any one country or, or, or certainly not around the world. Maybe Tim has a bit more information on that. So we get in principle by distributing a web, a web link with the help of Marta and her team in, in Lisbon. This was very easy to do. We, imp we implemented our questionnaire on a web link and send it through these various networks, which I've listed here. And we basically create a kind of a nominal population, a self-declaring population, 
people who self-define as science journalists or science communicators in a variety of networks around the globe. And we mobilized 633 responses. But as I said, we don't know whether this is 5%, 10% or 50% of the population of science journalists. We really don't have this kind of uh, uh, objective. Data. It's a self declared. Martin, it looks as if we've lost Martin. Should we move on to the next speaker? Uh, hi, I think I, I, I thought it was on my side, by the way. So uh, I realize now is Martin. Martin, are you there? Yeah, um, I think in, uh, my network has thrown me out. Thrown me out. Uh, may I just conclude or do you want to? Yes, please. Yes, please. OK, let me just uh, go back here. This is a, a very unfortunate glimpse here. So anyway, we ask a question about employment, we ask about workload, we ask about practices, we ask about the ethos of science journalism, the job satisfaction, the sense of crisis, what kind of solutions to the crisis, and maybe what are the COVID experiences. And here we are with this result. What I think is the stake here, and that's what I want to kind of make up, take Tim's point here. Uh, I think we have to care about an independent basis of science reportage and science journalism, because if the world is dominated by institutional uh, public relations, we really don't have a public sphere. We don't have a, a public discussion about science, but we have a celebration of science. And I think this is probably not what we should achieve uh, on, on, a, on, a light, on a wider scale, because there's too much at stake. We cannot just celebrate science, we have to evaluate and we have to think about this in the context of, of the future of society. So my hope in principle is, and that goes back to SIDEF, uh, let's think about uh, a regular uh, monitoring. And I'm looking forward to the SIDEF Global Science Report 2025. The work can start next week uh, from my point of view. Uh, thank you very much. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Obrigado. Thank you very much, Martin, for these words. Uh, about the changing structure of science uh, journalism, where we came from, where we are, and where we are moving uh, to. Uh, I would now uh, invite Luisa Massarani um, to speak for uh, 10 minutes about the results of the, uh, the report. Uh, Luisa is a science journalist uh, and regional coordinator for Latin American Science Dev uh, she is also a researcher at the Brazilian Institute for Public Communication of Science and Technology in the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. Uh, Luisa, please. Oh, hi, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I want to, to share my screen. Uh, can you see it? It's okay? Yeah. So it's a, a great pleasure to be here uh, for two reasons. First, because of the anniversary of SciDev.net. I, I was actually uh, around before uh, SciDev was born when Dave Dixon was uh, proposing the, uh, a, a website thinking about science and developing uh, in the developing world. So it's, uh, it's really uh, nice to see 20 years later and I am part of the family. And also because uh, we start working this global science journalism report since the beginning of the year. So it's great to see it uh, here <laughs> for us to, to share, to talk and to, to discuss about the comments. 
So this was written by uh, by myself, but also by, by my uh, um, very nice friends and colleagues, Mark Andradas, Luis Felipe uh, Neves, and obviously Martin Bauer. And uh, let's see, it seems that's not working. Oh, bye. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as, um, as Martin mentioned already, uh, there was a previous report in 2013. So we wanted to, uh, to do a follow-up using some of the questions uh, that we, we used it in 2013, but also obviously in a situation as the COVID uh, pandemic, we wanted to add some questions related to, to the pandemic and the perception of the journalists uh, in, in, during the pandemic. This report would be not possible at all without all the, the organizations that were involved. We are very glad to, to have such good partners, uh, but also the, the people who helped us in, in different countries from different associations, and also a uh, uh, big thanks to the, the, to the respondents. Uh, I believe that many of them are actually with us today. And uh, so we collected the data between February and May 2021, and we uh, had more than 600 uh, questions from all the parts of the world. And uh, so we, if we, when we think about the profile of respondents, it's uh, interesting to see that they are, there is a, a balance between men and women, uh, but uh, it's interesting to note that they are more experienced professionals and uh, uh, older, for example, in comparison to uh, another survey that we did among uh, explainers in science museums, in which uh, we saw that the, the respondents, at least in Latin America, they are much uh, younger. They, uh, they have been working in the field uh, for very short time, and uh, most of them don't have a, a full-time job as we can see here in our survey. And uh, what they say, the respondent in, in this uh, science journalism survey is uh, many of them say that uh, work has become more intense. Uh, and this is also true in the previous report. In 2013, they also said that work uh, has become more intense in the last uh, uh, past five years. And uh, we see that uh, the cuts uh, in terms of jobs were more significant in Latin America and less significant uh, in, uh, in North, Northern Africa and Middle East. And uh, for almost uh, half of the respondents in our survey, the work situation for journalists professional uh, has uh, worsened it. And uh, for a bit more than uh, uh, half of the respondents, working pressures are harming the quality of science journalism. Uh, in terms of, um, sorry, there is a, <laughs> I'm trying to, to see better my, my PowerPoint. So in terms of uh, some uh, characteristics uh, that uh, a good science journalist should have, they mention reporting the facts accurately, having reasonable numeracy skills and a good uh, grasp of uh, statistics, but also being passionate about science. Uh, and uh, most of the respondents agreed that too few people are reporting on the process of science as opposed to reporting on the results of scientific research. It will be interesting to think about uh, this issue now during the pandemic, because uh, as we know, a lot of stories are uh, actually about developing uh, drugs, developing vaccines, uh, some uh, uh, challenge in the scientific uh, process, and uh, trials, et cetera. And uh, so in terms of, uh, although they mentioned, the, the respondent mentioned some um, uh, challenge in being journalists, uh, in, in doing science journalism, we see that as the previous study that most respondents say actually that they are happy with uh, their work as science journalists, the happiest people are in Africa and the less happy, uh, happy uh, people are in Asia, Africa, but also in Latin America. I thought we can see that actually the percentage is really high uh, of those that are, say that they are satisfied. Most science journalists would encourage uh, a young student to pursue a career in science journalism. And the participants say that they are more satisfied with access to uh, scientists as sources 
but in the developing world, journalists are dissatisfied with freedom of press and access to information from government agencies. And uh, so uh, a significant part of uh, the journalists uh, said that they don't agree uh, with the st statement that science journalism is a dying profession. As Martin mentioned, it was uh, one of the, the big uh, uh, push for starting this survey. And this uh, was the same uh, similar survey uh, result we had in the previous survey about uh, the, 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 the number, the percentage is decreasing. And uh, uh, many of them actually say that they probably or certainly will be working the field in the next five years. Uh, so let's think a bit, uh, highlight some of the results. Obviously I have only 10 minutes, so I'm just putting some highlights. And in terms of COVID, what we see is that uh, uh, important, uh, uh, more than half of the science journalists has, uh, affirmed that uh, there was an increase of the workload uh, during the pandemic and the highest proportion of respondent reporting an increase in workload was found in Northern Africa and Middle East. Remember that th those are also the guys who were uh, said that they are very happy. Uh, they are the happiest science journalists in the globe. Uh, in terms of uh, information source, uh, they state that they use the basic ones in science journalists. But one interesting thing is that they uh, they are uh, looking uh, for uh, scientists in their own country. Uh, for having uh, the stories, writing the stories in, uh, related to pandemic. And uh, this is interesting because uh, I thought it is a pandemic, obviously. Uh, they try to bring the, the discussion and the results to uh, their our um, own reality. And on the other side, one uh, result that colored our attention is the fact that I thought it's about a pandemic, a virus, a disease. Uh, the journalists uh, didn't uh, uh, use that much medical doctors as source. And uh, in terms uh, of, uh, this is very interesting because for almost half of the respondents, scientists are more easily available to talk to than in normal years. And maybe not surprisingly, only US and Canada, they don't think that it matters. And probably because uh, in US and Canada, it's much easier to have, a, to have access to scientists in the developing world. And I can say from our, my own experience in Latin America, sometimes it's really tough that scientists uh, uh, answer us. So I think that because of the pandemic, this changed in our part of the world, but not that much in US and Canada because it was it has been not a big problem. And uh, they 37% uh, uh, of the participants affirmed that due to the pandemic, scientists are more open and talkative than in previous years. Uh, and uh, less than one third, but still an important uh, percentage, think that scientists are more cautious than in normal times. It, it would be interesting to try to think, uh, to compare the beginning of the pandemic last year and now when the whole discussions and controversy, probably uh, this, this change, I don't know. Uh, but uh, a last thing that I would like to highlight has to do with the preprint. Uh, as you know, we, we are facing an infodemic, a massive, huge amount of information has been released uh, and uh, and not, we are not only talking about fake news, we are talking about uh, information, uh, some of them very good information, but a massive amount of uh, information. And in terms of uh, scientific knowledge, at least in the very beginning of the pandemic, most of the knowledge was shared uh, via preprint, which is obviously extremely important. And in terms of uh, thinking about science journalists, using preprint, uh, at least at the beginning of the pandemic, was really important. And what we saw is that more than half of the journalists say that they use or have used preprint articles in their stories. 
what colored our attention, however, is that 41% of them uh, said that they worked with no change of procedure. So we do think that's important to look at preprints, but to be uh, even more careful uh, uh, when we write a story, uh, trying to double check the information, etc. So uh, I would like to invite all of you to download for free the report. It's available in our uh, website uh, since the morning today. So it's uh, in, in the, 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 the main part of CIDEF, so you can uh, find it very easily. But if not, uh, or if you have other questions, uh, here, are, uh, here is my contact and I will be happy to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, update on the current uh, working conditions and practices of uh, science journalism. It's really, and challenges as well, uh, uh, that the pandemic brought uh, to journalists uh, uh, in different regions around the world. Um, it's indeed fascinating to see um, data with such broad coverage um, um, uh, of this of this practice, sorry, yes, just um, we will now uh, uh, go to uh, listen to the other uh, panelists who come from uh, uh, different uh, regions uh, uh, of the world, and we would like to uh, hear their ref uh, reflections um, on the report and uh, uh, the consequences uh, of these findings. Uh, for journalists working in their in, in their regions, uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, Oshieng Ogodu, the regional coordinator for Science Dev uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. You are moved. Oshieng, you are mute. Sorry. Sorry for that. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I was saying, uh, Mata, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I would like to say a big congratulations to the team that was behind this uh, great report. Uh, although the team was saying it could be the worst report, but I think uh, it, it puts a lot across uh, in science journalism. So uh, thank you for the good work done. I have read the report, and uh, there are certain reflections I would like to give. Uh, in terms of um, work itself. And I could see somebody uh, uh, in the comments, uh, in the chat talking about uh, the gender balance. Uh, in science journalism in uh, this part of the world, uh, that is Africa, um, there's still great disparity uh, between uh, the genders in terms of representations of people who are working in science news media, as well as people who are uh, stories are sourced from. So pretty much uh, a large proportion of journalists in Africa are male journalists. And therefore, uh, it's, it's an area that needs to be looked into. And even if you look at the news items that are put out there, a lot of the news sources are from the male uh, other than the female. And I think there is belief could be right or wrong that among the journalists that it's very difficult to get female uh, scientists to interview as opposed to male scientists and, and that could be a, a, a sticking point when it comes to to that and the other thing that um, i wanted to reflect on as as far as the report is concerned is that of um, that louise has talked about the preprint that i think a lot of um, the journalist in uh, Africa does not really want to go that direction. So pretty much we are still, uh, we are stuck with the uh, peer reviewed um, uh, releases as opposed to going for the preprint that we still think that may still have some questions uh, behind them. I mean, for instance, in my region, I'm always very reluctant to take news from journalists who uh, pitch from uh, a preprint uh, so it, it, it takes a lot for me to, to uh, take one, and I don't think I've taken one in the recent past or in, in a, a pretty long time. So that uh, 
uh, is another area that I want to reflect on. And I want to also reflect on the develop uh, the growth of science journalism. I think if you look at it about 15 years ago, there has been a remarkable uh, development in Africa in terms of the expansion of the, the in the media space uh, for scientific stories, as well as the number of journalists who are coming on board to do science journalism. Most of them are freelancers, and I think most of them work for international media as opposed to local media, because there is a small space in the local media, but uh, this was, there are also the issues of uh, remunerations um, when it comes to the stories that they do. So a lot of them work for organizations that are probably not based in Africa, but are, are very keen on scientific stories coming out of, of Africa. So that's, that's an area, but as I was saying, there has been a growth uh, in science journalism. And I think probably uh, the concentration depends on countries like you will find uh, it's more concentrated in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria. And uh, if you go to North Africa, it is Egypt. Uh, so those are some of the leading countries where you will find a, a lot of science journalists um, and also the need for the information. So th those ones are, are my few reflections at the start of this. Uh, probably I'm going to say more uh, as we go on. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Xiang. Thank you very much for these uh, uh, very nice reflections. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Botina Wazama. Uh, she's the regional coordinator for science dev in the Middle East and North Africa. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you today, uh, celebrating 20 years of SciDevNet. And a uh, big congratulations for um, the in very interesting report that we are launching today. Um, for my reflection about the findings of, of this report, actually, uh, science journalism wasn't a field that was appealing to most of the journalists in MENA for a long time. Um, the journalists working in this field in the whole region wasn't more than like a couple of hundreds in the whole 20 countries. As it appears from the report, a high percentage of the workers in this field in our region are of a younger and less experienced individuals. Um, in the field in the last few years, it's taking like um, a great leap to be more professional and attracting more journalists to work in this field. Um, the work situation for science journalists in MENA has been improved in the last few years as the report cleared. Uh, we are the happiest, as Louisa said. And particularly the pandemic was um, a, such a revealing, moment, a revealing moment as the media organizations in the region discovered um, the huge shortage in professional science journalists to cover an overwhelming science-related issue like a pandemic. Um, for months in the start of the pandemic, there were floods of misinformation, disinformation, and even low quality reporting in the Arabic media. Then we saw um, kind of flourishing of initiatives uh, active in building capacity in science journalism in different countries in the region, like in Egypt, Tunisia, and, and Jordan. Um, I think this is one of the reasons that report uh, shows that a higher percentage of participants from MENA, like 70%, I think, are seeing that science journalism in the, is on the right track. Uh, in the region. Um, and there's also a high rate of satisfaction with the work in this field in the region. Also, I think um, this is a real help for, for, for this field. Um, as a region that include many, many conflict areas and even the stable ones don't have a wide margin of, of press freedom and suffer lack of transparency in information. MENA is from the regions that the report flagged up as a region where science journalists are uh, somehow satisfied with accessing scientists as a source of information um, extremely more than um, they are they are satisfied with accessing information from governmental agencies. Um, this might be also appearing in the main source of information that the scientists depend on, uh, sorry, the science journalists depend on in covering COVID, which was mostly doctors in, in MENA. Um, I personally worked in this field for more than like more than 20 years. And uh, now I, ha I have the same impression that science journalism now is almost on the right track in MENA. Still need a lot of support, but at least on the right track. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you very much for these very nice reflections. I think we will all be able to pick some of uh, these comments uh, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, Joel Adriano, who is the Regional Coordinator for Science Dev in Asia Pacific. It's a uh, good evening from here in Manila. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate everyone who have uh, uh, done a very good report and uh, also congratulations to uh, everyone in, inside there for our 20th year anniversary. Uh, for with regards to the report, uh, I have I do have to agree with Martin uh, earlier saying that the nature study is kind of inadequate to, to be called as a global study because it doesn't really uh, reflect the condition situations in developing countries. And so um, the, 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 at least the, the study right now is more or less, uh, it gives the, uh, uh, the voice to what's happening in, in many developing countries. And in particular, uh, science in developing countries is kind of uh, uh, young, much like the democracy in, in, in our region, very young. And, in a lot of uh, in a lot of sense, uh, that's also the problem, because uh, we don't really have that much experience in media freedom, especially in science coverage, and so there's really uh, uh, difficulty in covering uh, science stories, because there's a, a issue in freedom in general. So it's that it's not just media freedom. So, like if you're a journalist. It's so difficult for you to, to interview scientists because the scientists themselves have to deal with the government or bureaucracy. And so they have to uh, get permission first or they're very careful in saying things that they may get into trouble, especially in the, la especially in the last few years. Uh, there are lots of uh, government who have, uh, administration who have come in, in many, countries in, uh, in the Asia Pacific who are kind of very authoritative or kind of restrictive, like in our case in the Philippines, that's also happening in, uh, in Thailand and in India, these countries, for in, the, the, the three countries at least that I cited, uh, they have a very vibrant, free uh, media before uh, the new administration came in and which are very restrictive. And so it's like kind of difficult to interview scientists. Um, when it comes to uh, the situation now with COVID, it becomes really a, a sort of a problem, especially for new journalists coming in straight from college, new graduates, because they don't have the contacts. So unlike before, when you have these face-to-face uh, events, uh, actual uh, interviews, it's kind of easy for them. They will learn from senior ones, from veteran ones covering the beat. But now it's kind of difficult to actually learn just online and getting contacts because of, again, because of the, uh, the, the, the nature that we have in the Asia Pacific where Trust issue is one thing. And so if they see a new name coming up, they will likely, you know, scientists, officials will likely ignore that new name that they're not familiar. And this is where the, the veteran ones, the, the seniors, uh, uh, media personalities should be helping, should be coming in, uh, introducing these new names, these new people who, who like to uh, uh, well, I mean, I'm also just to, just to be clear. I'm not just talking about uh, very young new graduates, but also people who would like to have a career shift, because a lot of the, the uh, science writers are actually not not journalists themselves, but they are coming from different backgrounds or different fields. And in fact, uh, they have interest in writing. A lot of them are actually scientists themselves. Uh, and so, uh, finally. Uh, as Louisa was earlier saying, that there seems to be this uh, uh, image where uh, 
science journalism is a dying uh, profession. Uh, and that was a case in, in at least in, uh, in our region as well, but where uh, a lot of publications don't have really, they don't have a science beat, uh, especially, especially newspaper. And that's why very few people are into science writing, simply because they kind of see the, uh, the career, it's a sort of a dead end career. And the problem is when you specialize in science writing, you have also people uh, doing different bit who can write science stories. So they will seem, you have people coming in from, uh, uh, say, from environment, from politics, writing on your bit. And it, it becomes of a, and in many, for many uh, who's covering the science bit, it becomes a sort of a turf issue. They will see that uh, some bit writers are actually uh, coming in and, and doing their stuff, which they think should be more for the science writers. And, and a lot of times because of what Luisa said, uh, because of the uh, dead end or dying profession, a lot of the science writers tend to uh, uh, do a lot of sort of uh, second jobs or rockets. A lot of them are freelancers. And because of that, they actually do PR work. And that's where the question of uh, uh, Martin raised earlier as who, who are the science writers actually? And what exactly, how do you define them? And how can you call them as science writers? And that has been uh, brought up in many uh, previous uh, side of uh, trainings uh, in the past. And, and it, it, there's a common um, uh, sort of uh, agreement uh, uh, usually after the uh, training that the, the, the definition of a science writer becomes where one is uh, becomes more uh, professional and uh, and science is kind of a very big uh, a broad topic so that it's it's not simply uh, pure science that we, we can call science writers because even education writers, those from the academes, also those doing from technical reports, uh, those from agriculture bit, they are also science. They could, we can also consider them as science writers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing uh, these concerns about the dying uh, profession. Uh, I would like now to invite um, uh, Julianne Chong Wang. Uh, the regional coordinator for the French ed edition of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, SIDEF. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, Marta. Uh, I would like to congratulate all the authors of the report for their great job. They did a very great job. And I was very impressed by, by this report because uh, um, what it contains uh, regarding Sub-Saharan African French uh, was uh, true. I, I, I found that the report reflect the reality that we are experiencing in Sub-Saharan African French. I will just like to take three examples. The first one is the, 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 fre the, the frequency of male professionals in science news. For example, uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan African French edition of Side, we have less than 10, less than 10 freelancers out of 30 uh, writers. So um, it is to show that it reflects exactly the, the report. The second example that I would like to take is to uh, the fact that the report uh, said that the condition, the working conditions was improved during the last years. Uh, beginning from the last report in 2013. Uh, I think that this is this can be explained by the fact that the co connectivity, the connection, access to uh, internet has uh, was improved in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And today, uh, more, more and more people uh, have access to internet connection. And we can also say that this is, uh, due to the, the fact that work, work devices like computers, like camera and, and like recorders have become cheaper today than 
eight or ten years ago. So we can explain, we can understand uh, why the report mentions the in, improvement of working condition in science news. But in we we can also um, uh, say that this is maybe due. This is maybe due to the fact that the report. Um, the information that helped to write the report was collected during uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics. We know that the, uh, during COVID-19 pandemics, uh, access to science information and especially uh, uh, COVID-19 information was uh, improved, especially in our region. Um, uh, we, uh, those who live in our regions know that before before the, the this pandemic it was very difficult for example to get access to scientists to get access to ministers of, of health or to get access to uh, people working in, in in science in general but um, thanks to the let me say thanks thanks to the pandemic uh, most of these people have been given um, uh, press conferences and this allow a lot of people to, to uh, cover to cover science event to cover uh, health event and this maybe has also had an impact of, on the answers given by the respondent uh, uh, it is important to note this because in our region um, apart from what i have just said uh, working condition as not are not very very good in in Cameroon for example many journalists in in newsroom are now facing salary problems so um, this is why I say I, I have tried to understand why the respondent said that they are their working condition have improved uh, and the situation that uh, I have mentioned for Cameroon is also the same when we talk with our uh, correspondent, with uh, other if, if, with journalists from other uh, French-speaking countries in Africa. So uh, most of the newsroom in our regions are now facing um, uh, economic difficulties, and that is why I try to understand why why uh, people are comfortable with their job today. The last example that I will the last example that I would like to take is. To, is the fact that the journalists, the respondents said that they are happy with their job. And I would like to share with you here the, the comment, the testimony that I had with, a, with a, one of our freelancers uh, early this year. He, he called me and he, he is some, someone who is working also with a Pan-African uh, news agency. agency. He told me that he is more comfortable, comfortable when he works with SIDEV. And I, I asked him why. He told me that it is just because, it is only because uh, with white, when he writes science news, he has the impression that his work is helpful, helpful and can be used. The information included in his article can be used, can be useful for uh, people. So, um, this is a, this was a very uh, interesting testimony that I wanted to share. Uh, finally, what I would like to suggest to the authors of the report is that uh, maybe next time it would be it would be useful to um, to make sure that the 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 you allow more time for the uh, for people to respond. Maybe one year, maybe. Uh, six months, so that we can have more and more res more uh, respondents, and that that will help to have a more accurate report. So this is uh, what the comment that I can do about this report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Julian. Um, I would like to thank all these uh, four. Uh, panelists for their uh, important reflections on the report and the impact uh, on the work of journalists in their regions. Um, I think we might have time for uh, one quick question. Um, and I would uh, like to read this question in the uh, question and answer panel 
uh, and is for uh, Professor Bauer, uh, someone asking uh, among the respondents in the survey, there were also people uh, identifying as science communicators, not only science journalists. Uh, if so, it's strange because yourself pointed out that there, there is a great difference between reporting and scrutinizing science and celebrating it. I might have misunderstood. Martin, would you like to uh, say a few words about the respondents and distinction between science journalists, science communicators? Uh, I'd rather pass on this because I think this is a matter for, the, for, the, for the professionals to clarify. Uh, from the point of view of collecting the data, we have to leave it open for people to identify themselves of what they see themselves. So what the question seems to suggest is somebody says I'm a science communicator is more public relation oriented. So working for an institution like my own one, the London School of Economics or for the Sanger Institute or, or for something like that. And when you are a science journalist, you're working for a media organization. If this is the case, this is, is would be uh, useful, but I'm not entirely sure exactly where are these labels or how these labels are used and, and who uses them where. I think there's a lot of confusion about these terms. Uh, I couldn't comment on this uh, in a decisive way. This is more maybe for, for, for Tim to come in or, or Louisa mm. who might have reflected on this more. Yeah, uh, and uh, thank you, Martin. I will just read another one, which is quite, uh, it's it re related to what we just uh, uh, talked about um, and either for uh, the panelists to respond or then for Ben to uh, wrap up and bring the issue in the, in the, in the final words. Uh, most science journalists I know are self-employed freelancers. Do the panelists have any predictions about where this is heading in the future? Is freelance science journalism a profession that individuals can sustain and make a living from? Thank you for these answers, for these questions. Um, uh, if anyone in the panel want to say uh, something, maybe Louise or Ben, or... Um... I can add something if you want. Yes, please, uh, yes. quickly. So for, uh, uh, to, uh, referring to the first question from Michaela, I think that uh, some of us uh, can work as, uh, for, for example, my, my case, I, uh, for SIDEF, I consider myself a science journalist, but in my day job, uh, for few crews, I, I sometimes I refer myself to as science communicator because I do books for children, uh, exhibitions and other way of uh, science communication. So in that case, I would call myself as a science communicator, but doesn't mean that we are not not uh, following the, the 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 good ways of uh, doing science journalism is more like a label or the kind of uh, a science communication that I have been doing. So it's not necessarily a contradiction. And the second point from Nadja, I think that really depends on where you are. Uh, in Latin America, maybe it's more difficult to survive as a, a freelancer and maybe in Europe and US it's easier. Uh, possible, <laughs> feasible, depending on uh, the contacts, etc. So, uh, but anyway, I think that team also want to add something, right, team? Yeah, this is uh, this is a fascinating issue, and it goes to that one chart that that Martin uh, showed with the golden age of uh, of science journalism. One of the things that section of the chart really tracks nicely is the rise of science communication as a channel that a lot of talent and energy went into. As people were exiting the mainstream journalism, a lot of them began working for universities, a lot of them began working for government departments. These were extraordinarily talented people with journalism skills, and they wound up working uh, for, for what often is called the dark side. And um, the uh, you know more money, better hours, and so on and so forth. Not this sort of uncertain lifestyle of of a journalist. And um, the upside to all of this, I mean, it's a tragedy from the point of view of a newspaper that loses a journalist to a public relations uh, department. But the the upside from the point of view of science journalism is that now, for the first time in the history of some of these institutions, they have serious writers and uh, broadcast people uh, producing content. So you don't get these crummy press releases that are poorly written, not clearly researched, not properly done. 
you actually have really high quality content emerging on the science communication side. And as a result, we have some of the most extraordinary science journalism happening now because this is the platform on which that science journalism is built, a base of science communication. Many journalists won't admit this, but you know, they are, they, they're, they're riding on the wings of, of this whole science communication edifice that's grown up. Uh, I'm mixing metaphors terribly there. Um, however, uh, the challenge now is to make sure that that science communication structure does not eclipse science journalism. We can become so happy with all this celebration of science that we forget you need a critical eye. That was the other really important slide that Martin showed, which is um, it's great, you know, well-written, clear stories from these institutions, but that's a vested interest. That's very much um, their perspective. You want an independent voice on there. And this actually pertains to the second question because I spent 30 years working as a freelance writer um, and it is a precarious lifestyle uh, and it is an adventure. It is nothing I would not recommend to anyone. It is very satisfying. Um, it is, uh, you're making a positive contribution no matter what you do, but it, it is an adventure to be sure. And uh, I would point out to anyone who's curious about this, that even Peter Parker, uh, Spider-Man, had a day job working as a photographer at a newspaper uh, because he didn't make money as Spider-Man. And this is the ongoing challenge of every freelancer in the world. How <laughs> are you paying for groceries? How do you keep a roof over your head? And God help you if you have a spouse and children to worry about. Um, but that being said, these people are out there. This report shows that. And that gives me great hope that people believe in this. They believe in journalism. And the mission of the Federation of SciDev.net and many other organizations is to make sure that flame keeps burning. Thank you. Thank you, team, very much for these very inspiring uh, words. Um, uh, I, I think we have no time uh, left for other questions. There are still some questions in the, uh, in the chat. Um, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the panelists for this great discussion. Um, was very, very inspiring and interesting. Uh, that is obviously um, a message that we need to continue doing this work. Uh, continue understanding where are we moving to. Uh, and I would like just to invite uh, Ben now to wrap up uh, the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, the audience. Thank you, Marta. That was really interesting. And just to say that I mean, that issue of interrogating the science and looking beyond the PR, that's really something that's critical from our point of view at SciDevNet. And we need freelancers for that. We need to make sure that we work in a way that enables freelancers to, as you say, keep up the day job, not have to turn to climbing walls and uh, firing webs at night or whatever it might be. Um, so we've set up a number of discussion rooms um, to continue this really interesting discussion. Um, we're using a system called Spatial Chat. And just before you go across to that, I'd like to just explain how we've set it up. So we've set up five different rooms. There's a room to reminisce, a room to talk about future plans, a room where you can review our 20th anniversary magazine with the editor Joel, who will be there in the room. And that magazine is um, uh, linked to now in the chat. Um, a room to discuss science communication, where Louisa will be, and also Charles Wendo, our, tra our trainer. A room where you can talk to our head of marketing if you'd like to talk about ways to work with SciDevNet. So um, the, we'll post a link to spatial chat now in, in, the, in the Zoom chat. Please um, leave the Zoom meeting once you click through. Um, and then you'll see all of those rooms listed in the right-hand side. And I look forward to seeing you there shortly. So see you there in a minute.